And then finally, we'll look at the NFL over and under win totals for 2023 uh, and the best bets and picks for all 32 teams. This is again for the athletic. I'm not going to go through all 32 teams. I thought it would be kind of cool, maybe not, to look at the Giants 2023 opponents and go through the over under wins for each of our opponents. We'll start in the AFC East with the with the Jets, our Brohams. Uh, that we share stadium with the line currently, or maybe not currently, but as of this week on un- uh, nine and a half over under total wins. And uh, my main man here who I didn't get his friggin' name, but I'm going to get it right now because I believe we credit, we give credit to where credit is due. Vic Taffer, Taffer of the athletic. Sure. Why not? So the line's at nine and a half. He's got them at under nine and a half, which is at plus 110. And his reasoning is that, they, that it, well, the AFC East is one of the toughest divisions in football, but they also have the AFC West slate this year and the NFC East. In the first seven of the games of the season, while Rodgers might still be getting acclimated to things, are the Bills, Cowboys, Patriots, J- Chiefs, Broncos, Eagles, and Giants. And while you might say, all right, well, Patriots and Broncos, those are wins. Patriots are plucky. And who knows what the Broncos have in store now that Sean Payton's at the helm. So they could, I mean, I mean, they, I, would you be shocked if they go 0-6? Yeah, I guess you would be a little shocked, but... um. Do we see them at four and three? Probably not. Next up is the Dolphins. The line is at nine and a half, just like the Jets, which is interesting. And our man Vic has them at over nine and a half, which is at plus 105. He cites that the addition of defensive coordinator Vic Vangio is a big one. And he believes that the Dolphins are going to win the AFC East. Stranger things have happened, okay? Uh, I guess a lot of people are projecting the Bills to take a step back. The Pats are not the Pats of old. And the Jets are kind of, uh, I mean, who knows where we're going to get with the Jets? It's like, is this, you know, I mean, I, I keep going back to Brett Favre. But Brett Favre started 8-3 and three in 2008, and they missed the playoffs somehow, right? So, the Dolphins, whew. I guess a lot rides on, on having Tua healthy right? Not being thoroughly concussed. They do have Mike White as a backup now, even though they kind of got by and they almost beat the Bills in the playoffs with their third string quarterback. So um, they could win the AFC East or they could uh, suffer from the injury bug again and then, you know, lose double digits. But this guy feels pretty strongly about them getting that over nine and a half. And uh, okay, I could see that. The Pats, the line seven and a half wins and our boy, Mr. Tafer. Tafer has them at under seven and a half, plus one hundred and five, which is kind of weird, kind of weird. But he's uh, he says that they could very easily be own four after opening against the Eagles, Dolphins, Jets, and Cowboys. Yeah, I mean that's a tough slate to start off with. And uh, with you know, I know that uh, I think they brought in Nathaniel Hackett possibly to help out Mac Jones, but it's like Mac Jones, pretty decent rookie season, and not so great sophomore season. What are you going to get out of him? Um, lots of young players in the mix. His Belichick lost his touch, although that defense is pretty good. I mean, one of the, one of the better units from last year. So it's really all up to the offense to kind of perform and ball out. Um, I could see a lot of close games, but I could also see a lot of heartbreakers for the, the, old, the old Pats. Then the Bills to round out the AFC East. Line is 10 and a half wins. And our man... Our prognosticator, uh, Mr. Better Extraordinaire, has it under 10 and a half, which is at plus 110. And the reason is kind of bonkers. Josh Allen has hit his ceiling at age 26. <laughs> There's visible wear and tear, and they have a tougher schedule. And while I might not completely buy into that reasoning, I do kind of buy into under 10 and a half. And I can't really pinpoint why, but I don't think. Uh, that they can replicate what they did last year. Something tells me that they're they're just going to take a step back. So yeah, I think I would take Buffalo under 10 and a half as well. 10 and seven, you know, which could win the AFC East or it could end up in a tie, which they lose the tiebreaker and then Miami wins the East. I don't know. What a division. AFC East, that'll be fun to watch this year. Let's move on to the NFC West. Got the, the Niners, Seahawks, Rams, Cardinals. Niners, the line is 11 and a half, which is, seems like a tall order, but he's got them going over an 11 and a half wins, which is plus 115. I don't buy that. He says that it doesn't matter who they start at quarterback, which is just outrageous because Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel are that good and can easily win matchups. And it's like, 
you know, McCaffrey played all the games that he was with the 49ers last year, but he was not exactly on the field a whole ton, a whole lot with the Panthers. And Debo got a little banged up towards the end of last season as well. And uh, you kind of do need a quarterback. I think the NFC Championship against the Eagles proved that. (laughs) And there's now a Brock Purdy rule. That was instituted after that game where it's like you can carry a third quarterback and they can they can suit up and only play if the first two quarterbacks are knocked out and can't return, which is essentially what happened. You know, Purdy came back in the game because uh, I think Josh Johnson had a concussion, but um, he couldn't do anything. Like <laughs> So uh, and he cites a, a fairly easy opening schedule, which includes the Steelers, Rams, Giants, Cardinals and Cowboys. <sighs> I don't know that that Cowboys game is exactly an easy win. I wouldn't rule out the Steelers per se. I could see wins over the Rams and Cardinals. And I think the Giants give them more than they bargain for. I'm a little biased, but yeah. Seahawks are up next. The line's eight and a half. Vic's got him under. He says that they had a great draft at in corner Devin Witherspoon and Jackson Smith and Njigba. And then uh, already had a receiving core that has DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. So it sounds like their offense is pretty good to go. That it might be their young defense that maybe doesn't play up to snuff. And who do you know? Who, and like I said, I don't know what you're going to get out of Geno Smith. Is this really the Geno Smith to expect from last year? Or is it like this that was merely a mirage? Under eight and a half, though, he had a pretty glowing kind of thought process behind his reasoning. And then he goes under an eight and a half. So that's curious. I mean, seven and 10 or eight and nine, which feels right. You know, I saw a bite of that. And then we got those stinky Rams. My most hated team outside of the uh, the Eagles and Cowboys. Uh, The line is six and a half. And to be honest, I would I would have smashed the under. But uh, he gave some pretty intriguing reasons as to why they are probably going to go over six and a half. So it might not. I don't you know, obviously, I don't think the playoffs are really a strong consideration for them. They have more than 25 rookies at training camp, and it's like you throw enough rookies at the wall. Some of them got to stick, right? You are getting Stafford back. You get Cooper Cup back. Uh, Aaron Donald's back. Sean McVay's back. But it, like, it feels like they've lost their luster a little bit. So it might keep might be a case of where they're in a lot of games, um, but just uh, don't have the magic they used to have to pull out the wins. And they're playing in a... I mean, an interesting division. I don't know that it's that tough, although they always play each other tough. So um, I'm still taking the under six and a half. Screw those guys. I hate the Rams, and I only wish ill will upon them. Then we got the Cardinals. The line is five and a half, and uh, it's a bit of a rebuilding phase for the Cardinals, which it feels like they've been rebuilding for five plus years, maybe more, 10. I don't know. Five and a half wins is the line. He's got him at under five and a half, which is minus 150. Uh, he says the team will likely trade Kyler Murray, which uh, I guess made me gasp a bit and took me aback a bit. And then I was like, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Like, he's not really anyone's favorite there. Like, all the people that kind of signed him and made him the guy, they're not there anymore. So, yeah, they're probably going to move on from him. And then uh, he states that they're either going to draft Caleb Williams from USC or Drake May, who is UNC. I don't know. But for right now, the Cardinals slept through the offseason other than drafting a franchise left tackle in Paris Johnson Jr. New general manager Monty, Monty Osenfort had a, has a fun year of college tailgating ahead of him. So, yeah, it sounds like they're going to be like, yeah, uh, give it a give, go out there and give it the old college try. But we're going to actually try college to fix this thing. So that's the NFC West. Like I said, I think we beat the Cardinals and Rams. Those are two wins in our pockets. I think we can take care of business against the Seahawks in a close, hard-fought battle at home. And uh, I think San Francisco, we we kind of go toe-to-toe. And, you know, maybe it's not, maybe we don't, I think we are keeping it close to a score. I could see us losing by 8 or 10, but not feeling too bad about it. Like, let's just put on a good show. Let's just show the league that we've take the, we've taken the next step. So if we can take three or four out of it from the NFC West, that's a big time. And then, you know, the AFC East is like, I'd be happy with two and two. <laughs> uh, so now we've gone through the divisionals that we're facing. And now we go on to the same place finishers. We got the Packers and Raiders. The Packers, the line is seven and a half. And uh, I guess I was a little too down on the Packers. 
And I didn't realize the impact that Aaron Rodgers' departure, the positive impact of his departure might have on the team. So the line seven and a half, he's got him at over seven and a half. And he says that it's a friendlier NFC North. You know, the Bears are kind of still in rebuild mode. The Lions are looking good, though. And maybe the Vikings are on the downswing. So there is an opportunity there to maybe um, at least be in, the, be in the hunt graphic, which is all we ask for. That hunt graphic. Mwah. The in the hunt graphic is just so beautiful to see once you get to December. And then they face the lowly NFC South, which I think, you know, we've talked about this before where it's like... The Bucks are not the Bucks with without Tom Brady and the Panthers, though they showed a lot of gumption. I don't know if that's the word. Uh, a lot of resolve after losing McCaffrey and Baker Mayfield, and somehow still coming out with wins and fighting hard. Um, so then you have the Falcons, who are the Falcons? They're still trying to figure things out. So I think the Saints are probably the front runner in the NFC South and could probably probably come away with that division. Uh, which, where are the Saints? Oh, yeah, the Saints and the Packers and the Raiders. So, yeah. But we're talking about the Packers. They have two very good running backs. They have all the receivers that they drafted for Rodgers the past three years. And for the Packers' first five games are against teams with a losing record, so they could get off to a hot start. And uh, that's why he's got them at over seven and a half, and I might be buying into that. And I'm thinking that the game against them could be a lot closer than we think. And it might be one of those games where like we're we're at half and we're down and we're like what the f- what what what's going on? And then Wink cranks up in the second half and we figure out the offense and like we pull away, but I could see us like in that first half like we're just caught off guard and maybe they come out swinging. So the Saints, we're talking about the Saints, they'll probably win the NFC South. The line is 9 and a half for them. He's got them at over 9 and a half citing the return of Michael Thomas. Derek Carr now has uh, Thomas and Chris Olave to go with Alvin Kamara and then a good offensive line. And then you got Cameron Jordan, Tyron Matthew on the defensive side of the ball. That defense was so good last year and probably will be good again this year. And they could very easily start 4-0. So I would take I would take over nine and a half. I think I got them winning the division there, right? Right. And I have us I think I have us losing to them in New Orleans, which uh pains me because I think like I don't, I don't know that car necessarily scares me, but it's it's all the weapons he has, and then the defense as well. Although the last time we went, we were in New Orleans, we came back from what was it, ten points or more in one. That was that was the twenty twenty one Giants. I thought that game that we won in New Orleans with the twenty twenty one Giants it was Kenny Galladay kind of showed up for once. Saquon looked good. We had uh, Kadarius Tony kind of balling and wilding out. It just. <laughs> I was like, okay, we're we could do this. And then we just fell apart after that game. <laughs> so uh next up, same place finisher in the AFC West is the is the Raiders. Uh the line seven and a half. He has them at under seven and a half. The roster is worse than it was last year, he says. And uh I agree. I, I, I do think they might be fun to watch. I think the Raiders are always kind of fun to watch, right? It seems like anytime they're on a primetime game, they're usually playing an AFC West foe and it's usually fun and close. So I think it's they'll be entertaining. But yeah, I could see them seven and ten for sure. And then we'll get to the our division, the NFC East, home sweet home. The Eagles, the line's ten and a half, and he's got them at over. It's a minus one fifty. And it's hard to really say that I could see them going 10 and 7 or worse. Would love it. I think if we if they are at 10 and 7, that means that we've got a fighting chance to to either win the division, threaten to win the division. Uh, you know, I I was so high going into this offseason thinking like, oh, the Eagles are screwed, dude. Look at their salary cap. They don't have no salary cap. They're going to have so many guys leaving in free agency. There's no way they're going to keep all these guys. How are they going to pull it off? There's no way. And then they pull it off. The guys they lose, they replace. And then they have a, like a pretty kick-ass draft. They drafted all of Georgia. The Georgia Bulldogs, the Philadelphia Eagles are now the Georgia Bulldogs. The Philadelphia Bulldogs, they'll play in Athens this year. And uh, the favorites to win the SEC. So yeah, I, hard to see them losing more than seven, seven games or more. I'd have to take a closer look at their schedule, but it's just like, it would have to take like pretty significant injuries to that roster, which never seems to happen to them. Always seems to happen to us. So then next up, we have the Cowboys line is nine and a half, which feels low, right? Like, I don't know that defense, um, a a new approach on offense where they're going to run the damn ball more, I guess. So unless the, uh, I could see, 
I'd be tempted to take the under there because I don't know that Dak's going to really take that next step that everyone thinks he's going to take. You get rid of Ezekiel Elliott. You have Tony Pollard now. You lost Dalton Schultz, but you drafted a tight end. I could see them maybe getting off to a hot start and then crumbling down the stretch. Kind of similar to what happened last year where like they lose Dak, but then they, they're back up. I, I can't. Cooper Rush is able to ride the defense to, to wins. So uh, it would have to take something pretty bad happening on the defensive side of the ball from the for them to lose what is it eight or more games but i don't they're not you know like like he said in his his write-up like they'll they can make the playoffs but they're not getting past the niners or the eagles or a lot of the top seeds so nine and eight if you believe it it will happen <laughs> and then the commanders the line is 7.5 wins and uh our boy has them taking the under on that which is kind of a bold move i guess seven and ten isn't that crazy it's minus 150 to take the under and you know the big question mark is on the offensive side of the ball right i mean you have pretty great weapons in terry mclaurin uh antonio gibson they have a couple other wide receivers that are pretty decent but it's the defense that really uh picks it up a notch is going to win them games i mean montez sweat darren Payne, jonathan allen chase young is just like an outrageous front four and so uh, they could. They won eight games last year. They had were seven and nine, seven and ten the previous two years before that. So that's like the trickiest bet. That's a bet I would probably stay away from. <laughs> I don't feel comfortable with that bet at all. Either way. So um, good news is I don't see them doing much over seven and a half. Like if it is over seven and a half, I see them as like eight and nine, nine and eight. I can't see them as a ten win team, especially with Sam Howell as their quarterback. Call me crazy. And then we have our beloved Los Gigantes de Nueva York. The line, eight and a half. And this a-hole has them under eight and a half. And I think a lot of people have us at eight and nine. I'm here to tell you, erroneous on all counts. This is fiction, folks. I, I refuse to subscribe to this theory that we're going to go eight and nine. And yet again, he points to the schedule. Seven road games in our first 11 weeks, three in 11 days to open the season, and then three consecutive road games at Vegas, Dallas, and Washington to end that stretch. And I'm telling you, let's get that crap out of the way in the first half of the season. I am all for digging ourselves a hole and then emerging, rising like a phoenix in November and December. <laughs> Coming out of the bye and going on a tear. You don't want to look ahead. You want to play the opponent you're playing this week. And you also have to look at it as like they have to play us. And look at the teams that thought they they could walk, they they could just like walk all over us. I think the Ravens came into to the East Rutherford. They got up, thought they were gonna win, lost. I think the Packers, despite having a like not a, a glorious record, I think they were like two and two, three and two heading into that London game, probably thought they were gonna win that game. And we pull out the dub. So uh, I, I this whole tough schedule, and then he made a comment about like teammates will be questioning why Daniel Jones got the big contract. Newsflash, bro. I would be shocked if more than 10% of that clubhouse thinks that he doesn't deserve it. I'd be shocked. Just from what I've seen, what I've heard, I, there's no like rumors or leaks about like, oh, you know, whispers and grumblings about the contract. I, I, I don't know. I haven't really seen it. I don't think you're going to see it. I think a lot of people believe in this dude. I saw a tweet, uh, I forget who it was from. I don't know if it was Chuck Knox or Tommy Takes or whatever his name is. But this guy has been underdog. I mean, I fucking love underdogs, dude. I don't know if I've made that clear throughout my time here on the airwaves, but I love underdogs. And this guy is literally dodgeball, a true underdog story. I'm telling you, was not recruited out of high school. I think he was recruited by Princeton. I tried to get recruited by Princeton. It was a no-go. <laughs> uh and ended up walking on to Duke, I believe. Wasn't given a scholarship. Drafted six overall. People have been counting this dude out his entire life. And all he's done is set records, broken records, done things that other quarterbacks haven't done, especially in the playoffs. I believe in Daniel Jones. And sure, my Eagles fan friend likes to rub it in my face that I, uh, quote unquote, cried on draft night in 2019 when we took him six overall and not Dwayne Haskins. Hey, listen, we all have our misfires. No one's 100% perfect, but what I saw pretty much every day from him since then has has made me a believer. Like from his first start in Tampa in 2019 to uh, some gutsy performances in 2020 and 2021, yes, the turnovers were maddening. I'm not going to lie. And, uh, you know, there are times where you question it or you doubt it, but I was never completely out on Daniel Jones. 
other than I did snap at him <laughs> in the Tennessee game, the opener of 2022, where it's like, dude, you cannot throw an interception. We're knocking on the door, you know, inside the 10. Cannot happen. Ask Josh Allen about that. So uh, to to say that Daniel Jones were, won't be worth the contract is uh, as outrageous. I mean, we just don't get to the playoffs without him last year. We don't. And yes, Saquon Barkley was a huge contributor and factor in that. The two of them, that's a great duo. And we were, we didn't really get to see a ton of that over the course uh, of the years, at least with an adequate offensive line. I mean, you look at the offensive line they had to deal with in all three of those years, 19, 20, 21, and it was like, ugh. and not to say that the 2022 line was that much better, but it was at least enough. Combine them, their skill set with Kafka's play calling, and you can see the results. So yeah, we're not playing the AFC South this year. Kind of sucks. It's a bummer. But I still think... Um, you know, the AFC East will be tough. I think we can go two and two there. I think we go three and one against NFC West. What are we looking at there? Two, three, so five and two and one is three. Five and three against our two divisions. And then who you get the same place finishers? Raiders, Packers, and Saints. You can go two and one right there. So now we're looking at what? Seven and four? And this is where it comes down to what uh, an area that we could not we did not excel in last year, and that's divisional play. We stunk against our division last year. Kind of weird that we were so good with Joe Judge against the division, and horrible against everyone else. And then we're we're just we're not quite handling our biz in the division with uh, Brian Dayball. But uh, I think we can sweep the Commanders. So that's another two wins. So that gets us to nine right there. I mean, you think I'm out of control and out of pocket? saying that we can't sweep the Commanders, two wins. Win against the Raiders in Vegas, three wins. Beat the Packers at home, four wins. Beat the Cardinals in Arizona, five wins. Beat the Rams at home, six wins. Beat the Seahawks at home, seven wins. Beat the Patriots and Jets, eight, nine. And that's just out of vision. I mean, that's uh, without, you know, the Eagles and Cowboys, which uh, I believe we could... I believe we could split with them this year. I know we say I say that every year, but I really do think we can split with them this year. So, I I don't know. I I just don't see us taking that big a step back. And I guess it's not that big a step back to go from nine seven and one to eight and nine. I don't know that eight and nine is going to get us a playoff spot. And if we miss the playoffs, yes, that will feel like a step back. Um, and aren't we a better team on paper this year? And if we could just avoid the freaking injuries, which have been our bugaboo for so goddamn long. You know, um, we, we missed Neil and Thibodeau for a bunch of games last year. Adore Jackson for a bunch of games. Leonard Williams for a bunch of games. Uh, can the guys just stay healthy and not miss more than three games? Because I think once you get into missing more than three games, that's when it, it's like, I don't know that you have the kind of supporting cast to make up for that. But yet again, I think we shored up our depth on both sides of the ball. And I don't know that we're done yet. I didn't even include the article about some free agent fits. Apparently, there's still a thought that we can make an, one more free agent move uh, given our salary cap position. And I think the move is guard Dalton Risner. I don't know if he's signed yet since the article came out, but that seems like a pretty quality signing that I'm I'm in for. He's 27. He's played for the Broncos. Uh, you know, the Broncos made a move to get a to get a guard. So I wouldn't hate bringing him in and signing him to compete at guard because guard has been a major issue for us. You know, he's he's pretty he's Mr. Consistent. He started 16 games in 2019, 16 games in 2020. He missed, uh, looks like he made 15 starts in 21 and 15 starts in 22. That's about as consistent as you get. And his AV was pretty much the same every year. Six, 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 five. I I love it. I just don't think it's going to happen given uh, the cap space. I mean, they were talking about, you know, Yannick and Guacque and was it Frank Houston? And a lot of like edge rushers where it's like, yeah, sure. I guess if you get to pick one. Is it worth it though? Let me work it. Put my thing down, flip it, and reverse it, dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, do we really want to spend 10 mil or more on a guy that's really only valuable to us on third down passing situations? Sacks are huge, um, but I would think I would prefer a guard. How confident, I mean, dude, how much more confident in this offense are you knowing that we have John Michael Schmitz at center, automatic day one starter, upgrade from Feliciano. Golinski, okay, whatever. Risner at left guard, Neil at right tackle in year two. Thomas, all pro. 
And then you have Bredesen Azudu backing up uh, in the wings. I really like that offensive line. Just got to stay healthy. You know, to the fact that we went 9-7-1 and one with the receiving core we had last year is an incredible feat that I don't know if it gets enough press and media coverage. So the fact that if we can get Wandale and to stay healthy and be on the field, Jalen Hyatt, Waller, Belly, Hodgins. I mean, I, if we could just keep everyone as healthy as possible, guys are going to miss games here and there. I get it. Fine with me. Let's just not make it a huge habit and let's not miss more than three games.